Hi, my name is Kevin Clausen. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Base. Base is a tech-powered social club that makes it easy for our members to have deep, authentic connections in their cities. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in and welcome to the Fundraising Debrief, the podcast where we share the real stories behind successful founders and the recent VC financing rounds. My name is Vlad Kazaku and I'll be your host today as we interview Kevin Clausen. This is a very special episode with a good friend, fellow Miami builder, who started several companies, went through Y Combinator and created an incredible network of founders in every city he lived in. For more information about running a successful fundraise, including show notes, highlight clips and exclusive scenes, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Fundraising Debrief, as well as on our website at thefundraisingdebrief.com. This episode is brought to you by Flowly, the number one choice for secure deck sharing and fundraising automation used by thousands of founders from 50 plus different countries. Now, let's dive right in. Kevin, super excited to have you live on the podcast. Um, been a good friend so far and been really helpful in our own fundraise as well. So really excited to be here debriefing your successful fundraise with our audience. So just before we even begin the debrief, I just want to take some time to get a chance to know you a little bit better and know base. So can you give us a little bit of background on who Caben is and what do you do at base? Yeah. So yeah, quick background on myself. I'm someone who lived in very eclectic places growing up from being an ch- early childhood in South Africa, where my sister was born and I grew up as a kid and then spending years in Alaska through high school. So I had this very eclectic upbringing and actually my family's very entrepreneurial. My sister's actually a founder of a company that's post series A kind of, you know, between series A and series B today. So entrepreneurship has kind of been in our DNA. I started my first company in 2015, a company called True Public. And I've since gone on to start two more, the most recent of which is BASE. Really, BASE is really the modern social club. And it's needed at this time more than ever because, you know, we're living in an age where people are more socially isolated than ever before. And the reasons are multifaceted, but a big, a big catalyst of this is remote work and people now being so mm-hmm. siloed and even the way they work. And within a city structure, there's so many things happening around you, different activities, concerts, bar scenes, all types of things. But a lot of these places are places to go with the friends you already have. And it can be very difficult to meet high quality people in your city. And at base, we really make it easy for people, right? We just, in, in its most basic sense, we make it really easy by putting you at the right table with the right people, with the right conversational prompts, a phenomenal meal, maybe a little bit of surprise. And that's kind of the core of what the business is. My role at base um, is really around a few key things, right? Fundraising, something we're going to talk about. I think that's always a role of a CEO. Recruiting, casting an overall vision, right? But also in the early days, I'm our part-time designer. I'm our part-time HR head. I'm running our growth partnerships. I'm in charge of member perks. I mean, early on, right, you wear a lot of these different hats. So I think the main way to think about my role as we grow um, is in a sense, being the high-level vision of the product, being very close to the customer. Every single day, I'm trying to talk to at least one or two customers, either learning about their experience or talking to potential new customers and learning about their pain points. And those are some of the main areas I use my time. Increasingly, though, as we think about scaling and growing in other cities, we've had a phenomenal start to the business. It's going to be a lot about recruiting and thinking about how do we take a concept that's really working in one city, Miami, and actually scale it to another city, which... In some ways, can be. We think it can work, and we think you know it's it's going to be easy in some sense. But in, in other senses, we need to really nail that aspect of the business for this to actually be scalable. Absolutely, and can definitely attest to the value being created here in Miami as a proud main <laughs> customer of of Base. Whoa. But uh, gotta love that. Gotta love right? that. You're yeah, you're our favorite member. Number one, <laughs> I, I really appreciate it, especially you said it live while we're recording, so <laughs> you can never take that back. But really curious to understand through your entrepreneurial journey, you founded three companies at this point, and all of them touch in a, in a different angle, kind of this aspect of community. And yeah. as a person who've lived across multiple cities and countries, I'm curious, how do you approach, you know, networking and establishing new relationships in new cities and how that kind of fine tune your fundraising strategies as a result of that? 
Well, I think it starts off with a couple of things. You know, why did I have, I, why did I get good at this? I think I had to because I didn't go to Stanford. I didn't come from a background that had any connections to technology or any connections to funding. If we're talking about funding, there was no rich uncle. There was no plugged in person in my family, which in some ways was challenging, but in other ways I think was a benefit. I think the benefit was when I decided and got really passionate about building and almost all building today is, has some element of technology. I realized, okay, I'm gonna be in the technology industry. I had to force myself to, to get to know people in that space. And when it comes to networking though, the one thing I learned about community and the one thing I've been learning more broadly about human beings is at the end of the day, what we really want is we wanna just be, we wanna be respected, we wanna be heard, we want to be known. There's just some key, like first principle ways of thinking about this. And I think the reason so many people go around networking wrong is they go into any human interaction with this kind of idea in their mind of like, what can I get out of this person? Mm -hmm. You know, is there something this person can give to me that will help me? And what that does is that, you know, and we've all heard the story. We've all experienced this type of person. Maybe you've met them at a networking event or a conference. This is someone who's very clearly hoping that you can give them an intro or give them a job or give them something, something, something. Give, give, give. It feels I, transactional I a lot of times. Very transactional. That can help you in the short term. That can help you in the short term. You might get a, you might get a job. You might get a deal. You might get something. But it doesn't create any kind of – it's not a long-term game. The long-term game of relationship building – is leading with a lot of authenticity. It's seeing how you can help other people. If you, and there's always a way you can help someone. You think, oh, I don't have money. I can't help them with money. I don't have connections. I can't help them with the connections. You might have ideas. You might have feedback. You might have some way, maybe just encouragement. That can often be a lot for an entrepreneur as you, know, you and I know when it can be very discouraging. Leading with those things is I think that allows you to be someone that someone says, I want to, get to know this person over the long run. This is someone I might want to do business with in the future. This is someone I might want to, you know, work with in the future. So I think it's first a mindset shift and it's not going in with any objective. I think if you're going in with objectives to meeting new people, you've already lost. I think the main mm -hmm. objective is I want to get to know this person. What makes them tick? What are the unique things about this person? Because curiosity, and this is like a very Dale Carnegie thing. And I think a lot of that's kind of old 1940 science, but I think the one thing that does hold is you, Every human being, there's something you can find that you can like about them. If you can figure out what that thing is and or something you can like about them or learn from them and drill on that one thing, you can find it. You can find a commonality, no matter how different they are. You, know, mm -hmm. you could be a northerner from New York and you could be down in Mobile, Alabama, meeting with a southerner. There's some area you can find. I think the focus is on finding that versus, ooh, who do they know or some weird thing that a lot of people seem to do. I really like this and I like what you mentioned about like the authenticity, but also to some extent not leading with an objective. And I'm curious now kind of switching gears into the fundraising debrief of your recent round. How do you commingle the two authentic self, authentic mm. relationships without an objective when there is a fundraising objective? And this kind of is the, a great, the, the, yeah. the big question, like how do you build those connections? Well, this is, this is a great, great question because this is something I was very wrong on when I was younger. I mean, one mm. of the things I, I sometimes go back and talk to, I've gone back, been lucky enough to go back to my university a couple of times and talk with the students there. And they've been like, Hey, how do you get funding? You know, the big thing is when you go out to raise money and you're a first time founder, you're going to have to do that friends and family type round in many cases. Well, do you have family that can help you? Okay. Do you have friends? Well, if you don't have those things to get you going, even if you do have those things, you're going to need to meet other people that can help you. The key is thinking ahead. Now, that's not the case for all of us, right? Maybe you need to close a round. You don't know these investors. That's okay. But I think the first thing would be like, always be thinking ahead, right? The best time to meet an investor is not when you need to raise money. That's the worst time to meet Absolutely. an investor. You want to get to know them. You want them to get to know how you think about problems. I think it's the number one thing, right? You want them to know you're someone who likes to learn, you know, asking questions, not fake questions that make you look smart, but actual genuine questions that you actually want to know and building a relationship with them and letting them see how you think about problems months in advance of needing money. But let's say, okay, you have to talk to an investor today. You've never met them. I had to do that in many cases, but many of our investors over the years have been people we just met for the first time on a pitch. Now, on the pitch, I think you can create authenticity. I screwed this up when I was young, younger fundraiser. I was so bad at it. 
the only reason I was able to close money is from pure passion, but my technique was horrible. And the problem was I was going into my investor calls, trying to make the investor like me, Kaben, the person. Now, in normal life, you might want people to like you, but actually I think in both normal life and with investors, there's kind of this thing that holds true, which is if you come on trying to make someone like you, it can feel a little like you're being sold in a sense, right? The investors are not looking for a friend. If they were, they'd join base, right? <laughs> they're looking for a great investment opportunity. And they're really looking for a CEO and a team that they can partner with their capital and your effort. And really, I think you don't want to come across like this chummy style. You know, I killed that style. My style in their most recent raise, which is the style I'll always use, is radical authenticity. Because what I'm trying to form here is a business partnership. You know, and I think when you come in with that college kid mentality of, I'm going to impress this investor with my fancy answers and I'm going to have an answer for everything they ask. I think that's a huge mistake, right? Hmm. Or I'm going to make them really like me or I'm going to, oh, you were, oh, Bob, you're, you weren't fishing in Colorado. Well, I went fishing there too. Like people try to find those commonalities with people in real life, but like in investor conversation, not so much. I think what they want to know is they're sitting across from someone they can partner with. And the number one way to feel like you can partner with someone is you can trust them. How can they trust you on a pitch? couple of ways I learned was tell them what you're actually worried about with the business too. A good investor will hear the good and the potential of the business, hear also the concerns and the challenges, and they can right size them. You know, I think it's a flaw. A lot of founders are like, I'm only going to tell them the good stuff. Well, guess what? Every business has bad stuff, including yours, including mine. Every business has bad things, has big challenges, has monsters you have to kill. Let them know the monsters you're about to face. Hey, Bob, here's why we think this could be a billion dollar type of business. Here's the big scary thing we have to destroy. Now, if you tell them what that thing is, now Bob, the investor can go, okay, is that something Vlad and his team can overcome? Is that something that Cabe and his team can overcome, that monster? If you don't tell them the monster, they come up with their own monster in their own head and they think you don't know about it. So they think you're actually kind of stupid because you don't even know the big, you don't even know the big problems with your business. So that's, that's often, it's that authentic approach not trying to be liked, you know, just be, and it doesn't mean be rude or anything, right? Of course, you're friendly, you're gracious, you're humble, but you're presenting them a business opportunity. It, this is not a prize where they're giving you money for some prize contestant. It's a business proposition between two parties. Absolutely. And I think it's a very fine line to walk between radical candor and authenticity. And you said towards the end, accidentally or willfully being rude or quote unquote, an asshole. I'm not sure if we're allowed to say this or not on, on live, but it's, we've seen this before. We've definitely seen this before with founders who are coming in, quote unquote, yep. full of themselves, cocky. We're as founders, much more than investors. And we're in the investor role, which you've been until a few months ago, right there on the other side. Sometimes we be those founders, which are like, why am I even meeting with you? Right. I'm curious, how are you? approaching that, and maybe the answer is radical candor and authenticity of establishing and maybe moving away from this dynamic of power, right? Like who actually mm. has power in that conversation? Is it you? Is it the investor? Are you trying to speak as an equal? Are they trying to do the same? Where do you see that interplay work out? It's a great question, actually. I see it work out in the sense of the wrong way to do it is to think of the investor as your boss right? They're a business partner, which is a different way, right? They're probably more senior than you, right? They've probably seen more things. They've certainly seen more companies. They've certainly seen more battles as it were, right? It, so there's a lot to learn there. My hunch based on the real world feedback I've received is the best way to deal with the candor in this case is to let them into your thinking and your problem solving a little bit more. You know, and I think the problem is a lot of people talk about the solution and not like the thinking around the solution, which I think can help accelerate a conversation with an investor. That's basically instead of mm -hmm. saying like, you know, this is our plan and this is the thing we're going to do. It's letting them into your process. I think it help them make a faster decision around you and understanding how you think. And then the other thing on, are we on equal terms or not is. A lot of founders I know have this fear of these investors. Will they pick me? Will they pick me? Will they pick me? If you really believe in your business, and it's hard to do this at times, you need to get to a, we all believe in our businesses, but we all have doubts as founders. But when you talk to an investor, I think that belief side has to come out more. 
And you have to remember, you're giving them potentially the deal of their lifetime, okay? It's not just like they're helping. Like, I think a lot of founders think, oh, the investor needs to pick me. It's like, no, no, no. That investor picking our company, I certainly believe this to the, right now with this business, they made a great decision. And we actually gave them an incredible offer. So the investors, yes, they might have more experience than you, things like that. They need founders as much as we need them. You know, it's a very symbiotic ecosystem. So in a sense, I do think it's equal, but different. Mm -hmm. Well, equal, but different. I think this may be the subtitle of this episode. Just want to bring it down for a second uh, yeah. to the process. We want to talk some numbers because I think a lot of people are curious, especially first time founders getting on this journey, getting a little bit more details about how the round actually came together. So first of mm -hmm. all, you raised a pre-seed round for base. This is the first round of outside First capital. round, first round, half a million dollars. That's all, we need. That's all we needed. We had a couple interesting dynamics that are, I think are useful to know. We were raising this round in early 2023. Mm -hmm. This was in remains still the very challenging fundraising environment on a macro level. Our business base also faced a lot of skepticism from investors in general. Another thing I think founders should know is if investors don't like your business, you cannot take that personally, right? They, you have to also have the empathy for the other side of the coin. I think it helps you process things better. You got to understand a lot of founders, I think, think of the investor as like, they have this tons of money and mm -hmm. they have money to just play with. Well, in many cases, in most cases, it's not their money. It's the LP's money. They have investors and they have stakeholders. So first having that, that empathy can be really important. And for there's a legal fiduciary duty to those LPs to make sure they're returning their money. And their livelihood depends on returning that money and hopefully more, because if that doesn't work in four or five years, when the next fund is about to be raised, that money's not going to be there. I, I love this whole idea of having the empathy for the other side as well. You, you, you have to have the empathy for the other side in all aspects of business. And I think a lot of people forget it with investors because they just think, oh, this is a person that said no to me and told me my idea is talks. And that can be emotional because mind you, the tough thing about an investor rejection is not that some dumb guy you ran into at the bar thinks your idea is stupid. The problem with an investor rejection, not all of them, there's some investors I don't mm -hmm. respect their opinion, but there's many investors who think my company is not going to work the way I told them it's going to work. And I respect them. And now I respect them. I still think they're wrong, right? And it's a weird kind of mental place you can have to get to where you can still respect and empathize with the other side, but still think they're wrong, right? I think that's pretty important. How our round came together, though, is important because we had a business with a lot of skepticism. And it's not the answer most founders would want to hear, but I don't know if we can plead around in that environment, in that situation, without actually getting customers using our product and loving it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way we got around done is we had people using our product, revenue was growing, and people freaking loved it. And that seems rather obvious, but a lot of times it's like, let's go out and raise. You almost want to be, you want to be very targeted in how you spend time. Usually you want to be fundraising all out, right? Like a lot of recommendations that I s subscribe to are like block, block a month, block two weeks, like get all these meetings stacked up and then try to get this thing closed, you know, create some FOMO. Bring, these are all just like good mechanical things of a great fundraise, but really making the business better. Having some key learning, having some key revenue insight, having some key customer, you know, prove it more along the way is one. Two then, what we did was we ran a really tight CRM process. So like we built ours in Notion. We put a lot of names in there. It mm -hmm. wasn't a one, one man effort, Both Natalia, my co-founder, and my other co-founder, Ricardo, although I was the one doing all the pitching of the business, Natalia did join me for a few pitches. They were also assisting in the fundraise, you know, by debriefing with me, by being an emotional support. And if you are the one as a founder who's fundraising, you should be looking to your co-founders to support you in that raise, even if they're not the person who's actually pitching themselves. Once we Absolutely. got that lead, everything came together really quite flawed. It was like they took up most of the round. And really what it really what it took here was if I think back to our raise. It was on the first call, sharing a lot of passion and a lot of vision. And I think no matter what, when you first interact with an investor, you have to make an impression on that call. 
you have to cast a big vision if there, if you believe it, right? Mm -hmm. If you believe in the big vision, you got to go for it. You got to risk even sounding silly at times, telling them what you want to do. One, then what we talked about earlier, that authenticity, showing them some areas where you're not confident. Don't have an answer for every question. You know, my, something my sister, I think is good at is sometimes she'll just say in a fundraising pitch, actually, I don't know the answer to that. And she might respond with, I don't even think it's the right thing to know the answer to. Okay. That's a little risky to say, or, <laughs> you know, I, I'll get that answer to you and get back to you on that. Those are a couple of ways to think about it. So getting that investor who had the big vision, then creating the authenticity with him of, okay, this is someone I can trust. And then really updating that person with our progress was what allowed us to get it done in this round. Mm -hmm. I do notice that my worst fundraising round was my first company and it was hell. This fundraising round was like, I pitched 113 people, many of them multiple times, endless no's. Some no's that aren't even like just no's. They're like, not only no, but like definitely no, like they really don't like it. And it's so emotionally trying. And I think the problem I did then was I didn't run as good of a process. And targeting Hold on zero. a second. Was yeah. 113 for base or was 113 no, for the first startup? This is a previous company. After This is Got our it. second fundraise. We're going out to raise our kind of C plus at that stage. Okay. $2 million round and just a slog. And the reason was, is although the market was good, our business was not hitting numbers how we wanted to. We had some cool signs. We were able to raise that round, but we wasn't hitting things like we wanted to. The process was not ran well. I cannot stress enough. Pitching is exhausting. Do not count a 30 minute pitch call with a VC the same as you would count 30 minutes of knocking out an email or 30 minutes of working on design or 30 minutes of doing something else at your startup or talking to a customer. It's a performance in a sense because your adrenaline will be higher. You are, you have a moment in time to give some information to someone. It's, it is a more intense moment. And if you take meetings with people have, that have a very, very low probability of investing too much, you do two things. You exhaust yourself and you potentially discourage yourself and your team because you'll get more no's. I do recommend early on, Vlad, that people go out and do some crappy pitches. Mm -hmm. What's a crappy pitch? You pitch a real investor, maybe someone you know, maybe someone you don't know, someone who's willing to hear your pitch, who you think is a low probability of saying yes and you learn because they're probably going to tell you no and they're probably going to tell you why and then you get very targeted on picking a few select firms getting them in your crm researching them closely and when you hit them you need to be dead set on why us why now and also why you why why are you the investor the right investor that we want which is the other one to think about so I know there's never a magical number, right? But I like to also put a little bit of nuance on the actual numbers behind the successful fundraise, right? So first company, second fundraise, 113 different calls, a lot of rejection. A lot and of rejection. We, right. We, we're we already going to assume that a lot of people are going to say no. Fundraising is hard, right? Yep. Now coming into base, what was your initial pull? What did you start with top of the funnel? So top of the funnel, we started with... Two 25 firms that we b believed would write a pre-seed lead check okay. and were interested in consumer. We then, we first went after those firms. And I think the way to do this is, this is just my gut on it, is you pick some target firms and then you pick some people that you might not be target firms, but you might be a good angel check or someone, you know, can get the ball rolling for you is a good way to think about this. You know, maybe you have a connection or two that can write small checks. It's good to get the momentum going. You pick those 20 firms. What you'll find though, is through the process, that's why you want to run this process really tight. You want to get a lot of people as you talk to uh, investors and other founders, you'll learn of new names you hadn't heard of. You'll start adding those to your CRM. The big key is who's introing you, right? I think, at least I've heard it a lot, maybe, maybe you have better updated information. I think the best intro is a port co of that investor who's kicking ass and has been a huge winner. That's probably the best intro, right? Mm -hmm. uh, founder intros are generally pretty good if the founder's respected by those investors. So we would get the target firm and we try to figure out who do we know who knows someone at that firm. So we'd add in names to the CRM and this was more of running that process. And what that allowed us to do from a process standpoint was 
keep everything organized, stay on top of leads, always look for good ins to certain, to certain venture funds. But also it kept us from getting discouraged in a weird way because you want to feel, you want to get this list built out because you're going to get a lot of no's, especially early on. You know, you'd be surprised how crappy your pitch is, even when you think it's good. Starting point A versus two months later, ending point B. It, it does get a lot better. I think it's also important to realize that as part of your, you know, your target as well. Absolutely. I feel like for, in our experience was at the end of the fundraising process, we're like, this is the deck and the pitch we should have started with. And I'm like, <laughs> it's always now, just that now, way. Now we're not oh. pitching anymore, right? So like, what are, what, are, what are we doing? And I've had some bad decks, man. I've right. made some of the worst decks. Like, I think I'm actually, look, I, I don't think I'm the worst communicator in the world verbally from debt, but decks are a different medium. It's like a different art. You know, if a founder is not phenomenal at building a deck, definitely outsource the design and structure of that. And that's one area where I think a lot of people, including myself have bombed by making mm -hmm. it overly complicated by focusing on design and not message. A deck is a teaser document. You know, we use notion, we use notion for an investor memo, this raise for the first mm -hmm. time. I've never done that before. I like that because it shows the investor deeper thoughtfulness about your problem, especially the pre-seed. And also, even if the investors don't fully read it, it's good for them to see that, wow, this team has put in a lot of thought to this problem and a lot of thought to their solution, to the competition. And I think if I was an investor, I'd want to, I would definitely want to see a, uh, an investment memo. Absolutely. Yeah, I can image. definitely confirm that from both sides of the equation, obviously, as an yeah. investor receiving investment memos shows such a, ideally, <laughs> depth of vision and clarity <laughs> of thought, right, about what they're building. Sometimes doesn't, but that's also a great sign, <laughs> right? It, it, it gives you another data point. And as a, so as a data founder, point to say no. But again, you kind of have to shoot your shot, right? Like you can't, you know, fake what you're not, right? So like, it's better to yeah. do it and just offer an additional data point of yeah. what you can do. And as a founder... We did write an investment memo this this round, and it mm. actually did create wonders, not just for the investor, but also for us, because yes. we forced ourselves to ask the question that all the investors were asking, and in return, getting the answers that we're going to need when we go live, maybe in the first pitch, maybe in the second pitch, before we even send the memo to prepare for that. So yes, definitely, absolutely. It's great for internals. Doing the Y Combinator applications the same way. Like Some of these things are just good for you internally. We mm -hmm. do monthly investor updates that are actually quite in-depth, much more in-depth than our investors would expect. They're not for our investors primarily. They're for us. It's great accountability. These are things I learned later on, not with my first company. My first company investor updates, they were crap because I was thinking more like, okay, these people are watching us. Let's give them enough information to like let them know what's going good and bad. But the truth is it was a lot of fear. You know, I think the best standard is to be like, we're sending a monthly update. Super metrics heavy, no BS. If things are going bad, you'll know. If things are going good, you'll know. Because look, the truth is, if the company's not going well, better just to have it out there. You know, no, the uncertainty of like, ooh, let's not tell them everything that's going bad. That is a bad instinct for founders, not just for the investor, but for the founder themselves. Like, don't carry that stress internally. Get it out there, you know. I know that's not on the fundraising topic. That's more on like you know, post fundraising, but I think it's important. It is. And I actually had a question prepared for you writing investor update. So let's run with it now, because I think it may be very relevant for a lot of people, which is who is really on the investor update? Are you leveraging that as an internal tool, as an update tool, or as a fundraising tool for your next round for people who have not invested in your current round? Like what's your tactic around the investor <laughs> update? There's two different investor updates. One is only people that have invested. It's metrics heavy. It's how much cash we have. It's revenue. It's every metric. It's good, bad, and ugly. It's a lot of bullet point responses. And then it talks about new initiatives and it talks about customer learnings. I think it's really important to like early stage of the company. The most important thing is like, not just even revenue. It's honestly like, how fast are you learning? What are you learning? So we share all those internally. We want to of those things out publicly. There's a second update, which we haven't launched yet. So we're thinking of a 2024 seed raise. That's what we're going to do. We mm -hmm. can probably raise it this fall, but we're going to like push a little further. That's what we strategically decided for a number of reasons. We're going to approach that 
a little differently this time. We're going to have earlier conversations with investors we really like, some of which you know us, and we're going to start to release not a monthly, but a quarterly kind of for people outside or a periodic. It might not even be quarterly. It might be two months from now and then every month for a while. I don't know. We'll see. But I absolutely think there should be two. One that's internal, um, that's very much nitty gritty of the business. And the second one that's external, that's giving them a taste of what's going on. Uh, but I'm not sure, Vlad. I mean, I think that's one area that I'd be curious to learn from future podcasts and yourself. And because I, I do like the idea, instead of just a big investor update to a ton of people being hyper targeted, even ahead of the round and trying to talk to some of those investors over Zoom, like six months before you have to raise and be like, hey, here's where we're at. Here's what we're learning. Here's what's working. How are you thinking about the space? I think those calls are very fruitful. And I think there's two sides of that coin. And unfortunately, both sides, high positive and high negative on the side of being more transparent with prospective investors after the first round can give them that additional data point and continuity, right? Like we, everybody says uh, investors are investing in lines, not in dots, right? So they're trying to connect those dots, make a story around you between this round and the next round. But at the same time, there's enough rotten apples in the VC ecosystem that may take that information, send it to a portfolio company, a competitor, et cetera. So that's there's that the all that, right, that, that barrier between how much you share that's beneficial to you and how much you share that's actually completely detrimental to you. So, you know. I like sharing to investors only. I mean, if my gut is it's sharing metrics to investors only. If you're doing something more outwardly facing, I think it's more of a stakeholders message that's talking mm -hmm. less about metrics more about features that have been leased. City expansion would be a great example of something we could share, right? That's not sharing metrics with our competitors, but that is like sharing a significant business progress and in a lot of things like that. It's an open question. I think it's a good one because, you know, you'd hope that most people wouldn't be disingenuous like that, but we see those things all the time. I mean, it happens. It's, it's we're in a capitalistic society. I mean, it's, it's the arena in a way. Indeed. And I think the TLDR there is, be comfortable with whatever's more open in terms of an investor update to become a PR release and be put on LinkedIn, right? And if you write it in a way where you're okay with that being out in the wild, you're never going to be caught off guard with, with what's inside it. That's a good instinct for everything. I mean, any email I write, I would be okay with having it in the New York Times, just as a general rule. You want to be thoughtful about communication. There's obviously some sensitive things that you have to talk about, but absolutely. As far as that, we're quite careful. I will say it creates a lot of trust with your investors when they know you're consistent with updates and you're consistent with good and with bad. Because then what happens is you're going to go raise again. People are going to do deal diligence on you and they're going to say, mm -hmm. hey, what's the deal with Vlad's updates or Kevin's updates? Or what have you been learning about this company? And they're going to say, hey, these guys or these girls, they're doing a great job. They keep us posted, good, bad, and ugly. There's no, these people shoot straight. That's going to go, I think, a long way when you go to that next relationship, if there's that context. Absolutely. And I don't want to make too big of a pivot, but I do want to touch upon two topics before we mm. wrap up the podcast on the fundraising debrief. One of them, which is really important, pretty much top of mind for everybody since 2020, you know, in-person versus virtual during the fundraising mm. process, the ability to actually build a relationship with someone and explain your vision, your point of thought, et cetera in a digital setting versus being able to have a handshake in person and a PowerPoint presentation in someone's office. How have you seen that dynamic play out in your fundraise? And most important, right? How did the story of your lead come together? Was it virtual? Was it in person? Was it a warm intro? Mm. Was it a portfolio founder? How did you find mm. that, you know, uh, golden egg? Yeah, it was actually a friend of mine on Twitter who makes a lot of intros for consumer companies named Alex Kwan. He's a great founder of a company called Pearl. He made the intro. So it was through another founder. Mm -hmm. um, he had to personally jive with the idea. So along the way, you're going to be selling people who then go risk their social capital. Social capital is an interesting concept for everyone to be aware of, which is like this idea of like, if Vlad wants me, you know, if I want Vlad to introduce me to, you know, Sarah, Vlad is, you know, taking some of his social capital and he's spending it on me in a sense. And that's something you're going to learn. And that's another good quick aside, Vlad, is we need, we need people, like founders need to know each other in a fundraising process. I think the big thing a lot of founders miss is you knowing a lot of founders 
is secretly one of the best ways to get a fundraise round done. Like that is something I see time and time again. We got intro through the friend through Twitter. It was all over Zoom. You know what? I had my mind changed on this. I really did think in person was going to be the best way. And actually on company building, I'm more of an in-person person than a remote person, frankly. I probably lean that way, especially early stage. But frankly, I think you can build a lot of rapport on Zoom. I think you can then move from Zoom to phone calls and text. I think moving down the communication chain is always a good move with anyone. Getting them off email to text or two calls. You know, get off Zooms to calls, get off calls to text. That was one way I formed with, the, with our lead was me chatting async, mm -hmm. quick talk. Oh, he then he felt like he could hit me up async, you know, and we kind of form that remotely. And I think you can form it remotely. I think remotely actually can work really well. I think the one key is how you behave on a Zoom. I know this is a weird thing for me to say, but like, I think a lot of people behave on Zoom like this. They're like, hello, I'm here. You know, I'm ready for the meeting, ready for my pitch. It's like Zoom, you would never act like that in person. You know what I mean? So in a sense, I think one of the main ways is make Zooms more casual with investors. <laughs> like lean away, like look at something, like show them, you know, show them something from the company, like make it more interactive. Like I think that creates more rapport than like the very like formal setting, right? So that's a small side on just like Zoom etiquette. I think we can fix or improve. No, I mean, right. It's, it's the breaking <laughs> the ice, but in a digital context, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, being, be being comfortable creating a space where the other person also feels comfortable and at ease because when we let our guards down, information can actually share between the two individuals and hopefully your message is going to be better listened and understood on the other side. Yeah, and, you know, be concise. I went through Y Combinator in a previous company and the biggest thing they would hammer, hammer in our heads was like, this has to be explained simply. And this has to be explained in a way where it's not like, a lot of people try to explain things in fancier ways to make them seem more valuable, but the best ideas in the world are simple ideas, you know? So I think like simplifying what you're doing is something that when I've helped a lot of friends on pitches, you know, they've helped me. We've always, the area we always help each other more is like, Hey, this is too complicated. Like this has got to be simple. Like, imagine explaining your idea to someone at a bar who doesn't work in tech, you know, can that person understand the general sense of the value you're creating? I think it's a fun exercise to actually try on a stranger too. Absolutely. It's the adult version of the mom test, right? You just have a beer in your hand. So, uh, and I think the real yeah, test is the more beers part. you have in your hand, if you can, if you can <laughs> still maintain the same level of consistency, but that's for another podcast. Um, yeah, really, really appreciate podcast. you. Really appreciate you sharing all the all these thoughts. I want to move into a really quick, you know, five minute fireside ending of the podcast with cool. a few things not fundraising related to get a chance for people to learn more about Gabe and Claus and not just the base and the fundraise. What is one of the things that people don't know about you that they should? Something that maybe has not been incredibly public yet, or no one has written about it. If I lived in a world where I didn't care about, you know being a founder, if it wasn't my first love as an entrepreneur, I, one of my friends asked me, what would you do? And I think I'd be a history professor. <laughs> you know, I, I love history more broadly. I love to read. So that's how I spend most of my free time. I'm a oddball compared to my friends. I'd rather read a fantasy novel or a sci-fi novel than watch typically, although I do watch some things. So reading is really one of my passions. I started a book club in Miami called the big ideas mastermind. We read excerpts of books and we debate them left and right. So in addition to reading and learning a lot, which has been something I've loved from a, being a kid, I grew up in a very bipartisan world. You know, I, I grew up in, I spent time in Africa, Alaska. I went to American University in DC. I've been around a lot of far left liberal, you know, from a political persuasion. And I think it's been a great thing because I always seek out the opposite of consensus. I find it so interesting to bring people together with different opposing views, whether it's at our book club or through a conversation with a friend and try to test our thing, test each other a little bit, steel man each other's arguments, learn. So that's probably one of the unique things about me is I really 
that's something I geek out on is reading and, but also challenging those ideas with friends is something I have a few other weirdos that like this too. So we just get on the phone every night and we're like, let's debate this issue and we'll go into it for like 45 minutes. Great answer. So I'm really curious for your answer to the next question, which is like, who do you look up to the most? A mm, uh, couple people. Naval Ravikant is one. He's an investor, Silicon Valley veteran. I think his views on life are very balanced. You know, he's someone who's not saying, hey, go be a monk, you know, in India to find happiness. And he's also not saying chase the hedonistic, you know, what do they call it? the hedonistic turnstile of always looking for more and the next and the next and the next. I think he has a great balance on what it might look like to not just have a successful life in a monetary perspective, but have a successful life in a more holistic perspective as a human being. So I really re recommend The Almanac of Naval Ravikant. That is a book you can buy. It's really interesting. I am also inspired by rags to riches stories. I'm reading Martin Luther King Jr.'s biography right now, and I, I find a lot of inspiration in communities that have been, you know, that had more of a struggle, you know, because I think as entrepreneurs, we're so against the odds on things. I think there's some you know, that can be a more inspiring story. Oprah, Oprah comes to mind. Mm -hmm. She picked herself up from such humble beginnings and then became such a master of her craft under such triumph circumstances. And she has her, she's dipped into so many areas and aspects of the world. I find her to be one of the most interesting people out there in addition to Naval. And I'm sure there's a number of others I could think of, but those two come to mind. Awesome. And last but not least, who are you grateful for? Who do you want to say a public thank you at the, mm. at the end of this podcast? Fundraiser related or not fundraising related? Well, fundraiser related, I'm really grateful for my co-founders first because fundraising is trying on the person pitching, but it's it, there's a different kind of challenge to your co-founders who are not pitching, which is, holy crap, are we actually going to get the money or not? You know, they don't know. I mean, so I think that they were incredibly supportive. That's awesome. Number two, my parents raised two kids. Both of us are entrepreneurs. I think that came from the fact that they, they didn't say like, they didn't put us in this ego state, like you're the best or you're the smartest or anything like that. In fact, quite the opposite. What they did do is they said, look, if you put in the hard work and if you get better and you learn from failure, you can do anything. So I think they gave us that courage to go try and potentially fail, you know, which as entrepreneurs, we're all facing the real possibility that what we're dreaming about might not work out, which is, I think, what holds back, you know, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of more people that wish they could be an entrepreneur, but never have the courage to kind of make the leap. So I'm grateful for them for helping me make the leap. And beyond that, I'm not grateful for a person. I'm grateful for a city. I really think Miami is one of the most phenomenal cities in the country. It's, I think it's, I think when we look back on American history, the 2020s, will be defined by Miami disproportionately so to any other city. And I think that's for a few reasons. There's just the enthusiasm and optimism of new people coming to a city, the intellectual diversity we have and being a purple city in a country that's very blue and red, a city that has Latin culture, European culture, Southern culture, all colliding. I think that's pretty interesting. So I'm grateful I'm here and, and not elsewhere. So that'd be my last one. Fantastic. What a great way to, to end the podcast, Kevin. This has been an amazing pleasure. Generally, really, really much appreciate you joining us. And uh, I know that the people listening to this are going to get a lot of value out of this conversation. So generally, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, brother. This was fun. What a great conversation. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like and subscribe to our podcast and be on the lookout for a new episode in two weeks as we interview another amazing startup founder and debrief their successful fundraising story. This podcast was made possible by Flowly. If you're currently fundraising or planning to do so in the near future, create a free account today on Flowly at flowly.com. That's F-L-O-W-L-I-E.com and get access to an investor database curated just for you and powerful deck chain capabilities with advanced access and engagement tracking. Are you ready to take your fundraising journey to the next level and join thousands of founders across the globe who use the platform every single day? Find the discount code in the show notes and sign up today. That's it for today's episode. See you next time.